Thank you, Dr. Monton, for the kind introduction. And thank you, Matt Basemore, and all the wonderful students who help you in this wonderful uh, Campus Crusade for Christ. I have had the pleasure of meeting a few th throughout the day who have contributed to make my visit even more pleasant. And, and of course, I have seen the students who are making sure here that everything happens in order. Thank you also of the, all to the other institutions of the Indiana University that may have contributed to this event. I have been here before at this university, but it's always a great pleasure to come back. This is one of the great masterpieces of contemporary art, a painting by the great Spanish painter Pablo Picasso, known as the Guernica. Um, I think we would agree that this painting conveys a message, the brutality, the horrors of war, the humanity of humans to humans. This was after the Nazis had bombed a civilian population in Spain and have killed 25% of the inhabitants. So we would agree that it has been designed intentionally in the same way that we would agree that the watch has been designed to tell time and a car has been designed by transportation. You can see there are the letters of the alphabet and the nine digits. These are butterfly wings. Now we could use these letters to write English text and the digits to make arithmetic calculations. But I think most of you would agree with me that they have not been designed for that purpose in the same way that we would not say that a mountain has been designed for skiing although we can use the mountain for skiing, and we can use a river for navigation, but it has not been designed for that purpose. The point that we'll be making is the human eye shares something in common with the painting and the watch and the car, and something in common with the butterfly wings and the mountain and the river. It shares in common with the first set in that if it were not because of the purpose it serves, the purpose of seeing, it will not have come to be. But it shares with the butterfly wing, wings and the mountain and the river that it is the result of natural processes. It is not the result of an intentional design by an intelligent designer. And we owe this understanding of are organs that have functions that have been designed for a purpose, but they have not been designed by a designer to Darwin's discovery of natural selection. The Copernican Revolution, so-called, started with Nicolai's, Nicolai Copernicus, who in the year of 1543, the year of his death, published this book, on the revolutions of celestial bodies, where he argues that the Earth is not the center of the universe, as it was generally accepted at the time, and as shown, for example, in this contemporary book, a German book, where we can see the Earth Terra. In Latin, all scientific books at that time and for the following two centuries were written in Latin. So we have the Earth and the Moon, and then you have here Mercury, Venus, and then the Sun going around, like the other planets around the Earth, then Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and the stellar constellations. In contrast, Copernicus argued that the center of the known universe was the Sun, Sol, then Mercury, Venus, the Earth with the Moon, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and the celestial stars. But to understand the meaning of the Copernican Revolution, 
one has to go one step farther and look into some of his successors, of which I have lighted here two, Galileo and Newton, who lived 100 years apart of each other, and Galileo 100 years approximately after Copernicus, and they jointly represent of the beginning of science in the modern sense of the word. The commitment to the notion that the material universe, the natural universe, consists of matter in motion governed by natural laws. Laws that can be discovered, that are simple, that are universal in the sense that they apply on earth as well as, well as in the heavens, and that they can, subject, can be subject to test by observation and experiment, like this law of force equal mass times acceleration, or the inverse square law of attraction, that the attraction between two bodies is proportional to the product of the masses, but inversely related to the square of their distance. They have left out organisms. They had been left out of the scientific revolution for a very good reason that had been argued by, argued by philosophers and theologians, even in classical Greece before the time of Christ and all through the centuries, but had been stated or was eventually stated better by William Paley than by anybody else ever or, or since. Uh, in this book, Natural Theology, which was part of the canon at Cambridge when, the chance, when Darwin was a student and therefore uh, he read and studied uh, William Paley with great appreciation. William Paley developed an extended argument which starts with the human eye, pointing out that the human eye consists of numerous parts uh, here we have the cornea, the iris, the lens, the nerve, uh, which sends the information from the retina to the brain, the retina, and many others. And he says that all these parts are precisely adjusted one to the other, in the same way as the parts of a watch are assigned and to fit one with the other, designed to fit one with the other, so that the watch can tell time. 